Hi everybody, it's Harvard Lawyer Lee. Todd and Julie Chrisley were convicted of tax evasion and bank fraud back on June 7, 2022 in the Northern District of Georgia. Right now, the Chrisleys are awaiting sentencing, facing up to 30 years in prison each. But the Chrisleys have filed a bombshell motion for a new trial. Has the IRS just handed the Chrisleys a get out of jail free card? Has the government screwed up its case against Todd and Julie Chrisley? And will this mean the Chrisleys will go free or at least get a new trial? I really struggled preparing this video because it's complicated and I wanted to make sure I explained it so you can understand. So I'm gonna do two things. First, if you've been with the channel, you know I try to make my videos as short as possible. This is gonna be a little longer than my average video. And second, I'm introducing a new feature, the One Minute Law School, to make one issue in particular easier to understand. Could you please help me by writing in the comments, either Lee I understood or Lee I still don't get it? No shade on you if you don't get it. It just means I need to work harder on explaining things. It would help me to know how I'm doing on making complex issues simple and easy to understand because that is my goal, to make videos that make the biggest and most important cases understandable for everybody. I'm gonna divide this into four parts. First, I'm gonna give a one minute overview of the Chrisley's case and their motion for a new trial. Second, I'll talk about the first reason the Chrisley's give for a new trial. Third, I'll give you the one minute law school so that you can understand the fourth part, which we'll talk about the second reason the Chrisley's say the court should give them a new trial. We'll start with the one minute overview. In June of this year, 2022, the Chrisleys were convicted of tax evasion and bank fraud. The government and the jury absolutely threw the book at the Chrisleys. They convicted them of every count the government put up, eight counts against Todd Chrisley, 10 against Julie Chrisley, and three against their accountant, Peter Tarantino. But the Chrisleys have filed a motion for a new trial, asking the court to give them a do-over to throw out the first trial with its bad result and let them try again with a brand new trial. The fact that they filed the motion for a new trial is not that surprising. Tons of parties who lose at trial file motions for a new trial. But in most cases, those motions are just filed because, well, really not for much reason at all. Nobody really thinks the motion is going to win. The motion gets very quickly denied by the court and the parties move on to the appeal. But the Chrisley's motion is different. Their motion for a new trial has real teeth to it. The Chrisley's argued that their trial was fundamentally unfair in two ways. First, they say that an IRS officer got on the stand, lied, and committed perjury. Second, the Chrisley's say evidence was allowed in at trial even though the court itself had already ruled the evidence was improper. The Chrisley's say that if the court rules with them on either one of these grounds, they should get a new trial. Are they going to get one? Before we get into it, please don't forget to make the YouTube algorithm happy by liking the video. And please subscribe and come back for more. As I get into the analysis, the most important thing to note is that we don't have the government's response yet. One side always sounds right until the other comes and explains how the first side was all wrong. But I will tell you, these seem like very serious issues of a far greater magnitude than your normal motion for new trial. I am really looking forward to reading what the government has to say. Let's start with the lying IRS officer allegations. At trial, the government put up a revenue officer for the IRS as a witness. I've decided not to use this officer's name in the video. Her name is public record because she testified at trial, but my guess is that she just made a mistake and does not deserve the wrath of the internet Sometimes people just get too mean out there, you know? So anyway, Officer X testified that the Chrisleys still owed taxes for at least 2014, 2015, and 2016. She said she was sure of that because just the day before her testimony, she had looked in the IRS's internal system. Here is specifically what she told the jury. Question. Okay, now in 2014, there was a balance of about $77,000 that was fully paid, correct? Answer, 2014? Question, yes. Answer, that's not accurate. Question, okay. Do you have your schedule there of payments and the like? Answer, no. 
Question, in fact, the final return for 2014 showed zero, correct? Answer, that's not accurate. Question, you don't believe that? Answer, I checked yesterday. There is a balance owed for 2014. Question, no, no, the return, the return. The final return for tax year 2014 shows zero. Is that correct? Answer, I don't know about the return. I know there's an amount owed. I know there's an outstanding balance for 2014. Not only did Officer X insist there was money owed for 2014, she said the same thing about 2015 and 2016. Question, let's go to 2015. Isn't it true that neither Todd nor Julie owes a penny? Answer, that's not true. Question, any idea of the amount? Answer, I can give an approximate amount of what they owe for everything that's outstanding. Question, I don't want you to guess. I really don't. Do you have a number for 2015? Answer, no. Question, would you get that for us? Answer, uh-huh. Question, 2016, isn't it true they don't owe any money? Answer, no, they owe. Question, do you know the number? Answer, no. Question, you'll let us know? Answer, yes. You can see from this that Officer X was very clear that the Chrisleys had not paid. And you can also see that the Chrisley's lawyer is confused. No doubt his clients had told him they had paid. And as it turns out, apparently Officer X was dead wrong. Let's find out what happened. Officer X testified on the second and third days of trial. Trial lasted for two full weeks plus jury deliberations. Yet at no point during the trial did Officer X or the government contact the defense counsel to tell them the amount Officer X believed was owed. Of course, I do have to say, it also seems the defense counsel didn't follow up on the issue either. But then, three weeks after the trial, Officer X did contact the Chrisley's new accountant, Bruce Seckendorf, who was not the one convicted alongside them. The Chrisley's attached an affidavit from Seckendorf to their motion for new trial, and here's what he said. First, he said he knew for a fact that the Chrisley's had made payments in 2021 and 2022 to take care of the tax they owed for 2014, 2015, and 2016. Now note that they didn't pay until 2021 and 2022, which is pretty late. In fact, it is possible that one of the key reasons for paying was because they were about to go to trial and they didn't want an IRS officer to get up and say they hadn't paid, which happened anyway. And here's where the affidavit from accountant Seckendorf gets really juicy. Seckendorf says that three weeks after the trial ended, Officer X called Seckendorf and admitted that the IRS had received the Chrisley's payments for 2014, 2015, and 2016. Officer X said that the IRS had just not applied the payments to the balances the Chrisley owed for those years. In other words, the IRS had the money, but it had not actually credited it to the Chrisley's account yet. And now, here's the government lawyer learning this news. As for the Chrisley's attorney, I bet at first he was mad, but that probably pretty quickly turned into this. And believe it or not, there's more. Accountant Seckendorf said he spoke to Officer X a second time, but this second time, she insisted on having her supervisor sit in on the phone call with her. In the second phone call, Officer X confirmed that 2014 and 2015 were paid in full, but said $3,000 was still owed on 2016. In his affidavit, Seckendorf said he believed the $3,000 was just interest and penalties because the IRS had never credited the Chrisleys with having paid. So to put this in everyday terms, it's as if you paid your credit card and the credit card company took your money, but never bothered to give your credit on your account. The credit card company kept telling you that you still hadn't paid your bill and kept adding interest and penalties saying you hadn't paid. The question the judge will have to decide is, is there any reasonable likelihood that the false testimony could have affected the judgment of the jury? And the Chrisleys say, absolutely it could have. First, the Chrisleys argue it could have affected Officer X's credibility. Officer X was the lead detective, so whether the jury believed her mattered a great deal. 
Second, the Chrisleys say the government used Officer X's testimony to tell the jury that the Chrisleys had avoided paying taxes and were deceptive with Officer X. The Chrisleys say just the opposite was true. The Chrisleys did pay, and Officer X was the one who was deceptive. Third, when the jury was deciding whether the Chrisleys were guilty of tax evasion for other years, they might have taken into account the fact that the Chrisleys still had not bothered to pay 2014, 2015, or 2016. The jury might have decided the Chrisleys were just the kind of folks who don't pay taxes. And the Chrisleys have a good point there, although I would like to note that they, in fact, did not make these payments until shortly before trial in 2021 and 2022, so roughly six years late. Fourth, and this is a good point, remember that the government tried to keep the Chrisleys from introducing any evidence that they had paid taxes in some years, and the court ruled against the government. So the defense counsel went all in in opening statement, claiming the Chrisleys had paid their taxes in these other years, which meant the attorney and also the Chrisleys really had egg on their faces when Officer X claimed they still hadn't paid. Now you may be thinking that how the jury perceives the attorney isn't really that big a deal, but it's actually a very important point. The jury has to believe the lawyer just like the jury believes a witness or a party. Good attorneys put a lot of effort into making sure everything they say to the jury is something the jury can fully believe. Finally, the Chrisleys point out that they decided not to testify at trial, which was their right. But they hint that maybe, just maybe, they would have made a different decision if Officer X had told the truth. I seriously doubt they would have testified under any circumstances. And they don't come right out and say they would have. But they have a point. You make a decision like that in context. And here, the context included a government official who had testified that they had not paid when in fact they had. These allegations by the Chrisleys are quite serious, not the usual arguments you see in a motion for a new trial. Two questions come to my mind. First, why didn't the Chrisleys attorney cross-examine Officer X using the cashed checks that proved the Chrisleys had paid or maybe the cover letters they sent with their checks? I'm not pretending that canceled checks would have undone the damage of having an IRS officer come in and testify that your clients did not pay their taxes. But I'm still surprised the Chrisleys did not push back more. Maybe they were afraid Officer X would double down on her testimony and make things worse. Maybe the attorney didn't have the documents with him at trial. I don't know, but it was something that stuck out to me. And my second question is, what is the government going to say in its response? Is there an answer that will explain all of this away? And I'm only getting started. The second ground for a new trial is also very interesting. Before we get into that, introducing our new feature, the One Minute Law School. This will help you understand the Chris Lee's second argument. Here's what the Fourth Amendment says. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now, what does that mean in real terms? That means that the U.S. government is not allowed to search you or your documents or your stuff unless it's reasonable for it to do so. And if the government is going to get a warrant to search you or your stuff, then somebody in the government has to sign an affidavit or testify about what exactly they are going to search and what they are going to take. And the government has to take that affidavit to a judge and get the judge to issue a warrant before the government can start the search. If the government violates this rule, then the government will not be allowed to use the evidence that it found when it goes to trial. That raises a concern though. What if the government tried to sneak around that rule by getting stuff illegally and then using those documents to go out and get more documents and just use those documents instead? The courts have already addressed that. The courts have told the government that if you get documents illegally, you can't use those documents and you also can't use anything that you only found because you used documents you got in that illegal search. The courts call those newer documents the fruit of the poisonous tree. 
I'm using the word documents, but it also could be stuff, evidence other than pieces of paper. But there is an exception, of course. There's always an exception, isn't there? You can probably already see where it would be. The government is still free to go out and get new documents. It can't use the documents that were found illegally, even to find new documents. But if it finds new documents on its own, without using the illegal ones, it can use those documents. All right, so congratulations. You have completed your first one minute of law school. I think that was a little longer than one minute. I may have to rename that segment, or maybe we could just agree that I mean one lawyer minute, and everybody knows how lawyers like to talk, so it's reasonable that that'd be a little longer, maybe, than your average minute. And now, on to the Chrisleys case. The Chrisleys say that the government violated their Fourth Amendment rights when it searched two warehouses and seized documents they had in the warehouse. And the court agreed. The court ruled that the warehouse searches were unconstitutional. That means that under the Constitution, the documents that the Georgia Department of Revenue found in the search could not be used against the Chrisleys at trial. And remember, it also means that the government could not use the evidence from the warehouses to go get more evidence. That would be the fruit of the poisonous tree. After it searched the warehouses, the government sent subpoenas to Google and AOL to get emails and electronic documents. So you're already thinking. The question is going to be, did the government find those documents on its own, or are they the fruit of the poisonous tree? But before we even get to that question, the Chrisleys filed a motion saying that the AOL Google search warrant was too broad, that it asked for documents that the government didn't have a legitimate right to get. The court ruled against the Chrisleys on that motion, so it said the subpoena was information the government was entitled to get. But the Chrisleys say they have a second ground for keeping out those Google AOL documents. Forget the search warrant and whether it was done right. The Chrisleys say that the government only managed to get that search warrant at all because it relied on the evidence from the warehouses. And that, the Chrisleys say, makes the Google AOL documents the fruit of the poisonous tree. Here's why the Chrisleys think that. First, when the federal government opened its investigation, it said it was opening it predicated upon information received from the local news media as well as the Georgia Department of Revenue. The Georgia Department of Revenue is the government entity that searched the warehouses. Second, on February 7, 2018, the agent, not the same as Officer X, opened and reviewed the warehouse documents, the illegal ones. About three weeks later, on March 1st, 2019, the agent got a search warrant for Google and AOL, and three weeks later, he got a second search warrant for Google. When he got the search warrants, the agent filed an affidavit that said, when reviewing the search warrant materials obtained through the Georgia Department of Revenue, that's the documents that were illegally obtained, investigators found cut and pasted 2014 bank statements in the name of Julie Chrisley and Seven Seas Production, and two, requests for mortgage assistance by Todd Chrisley, claiming he had difficulty repaying mortgages. In other words, the agent justified getting the Google AOL documents based on the documents that had been illegally obtained. Now we know the government is going to argue that it had independent sources that led it to the Google AOL documents because the government already told the judge that. But the wording is a real problem for the government. The agent specifically said he was relying on the warehouse documents. And the Chrisleys point out that even though the government now claims it had independent sources that led it to these documents, it didn't mention those independent searches in the search warrant. Before trial, the Chrisleys filed a motion asking the court to make the government present the evidence that shows it had independent sources that led it to the documents or that it would have inevitably discovered it even without the warehouse documents, but the court never held a hearing. According to the Chrisleys, even the government wanted a hearing because it knew it needed to present the evidence so that it would be in the record for an appeal, but the court refused to allow one, which, well, may have been a mistake. The court said it didn't need to allow a hearing because it had ruled against the Chrisleys on the Google AOL motion, but the Chrisleys point out that those were two separate motions. The Chrisleys thought that the search that netted the Google AOL documents was too broad, 
But the Chrisleys say that even if that search was not too broad, there's a second reason to exclude those documents. And that second reason is that those documents are the fruit of the poisonous tree. The court also said that the Chrisleys motion was untimely, that it should have been filed back when the court first ruled that the Google AOL documents could come in. But the Chrisleys say they filed their motion shortly after they learned the government was going to claim it had an independent ground for getting those Google AOL documents and evidence. The Chrisleys say even the government agrees the motion was timely. So it seems that the Chrisleys thought that nearly all the key evidence against them had been suppressed and would not be coming in at trial. And then a lot of that evidence ended up coming in. That would explain why the Chrisleys seemed so surprised by their convictions and why they never took a plea deal. Now notice that neither of these issues has anything to do with the Chrisleys being innocent. If the Google AOL documents were the fruit of the poisonous tree, then that would mean that the government can't use those documents, but the documents do still exist. I am waiting with bated breath for the government's response because these are very significant issues. So be sure to subscribe with the notifications on. I will update you when the government files its response. And don't forget to like the video and also tell me in the comments if this was something you understood or if I need to work even harder to simplify it and make it clear. See you in the next video.